On tap today, we have Peter David. How are you doing today? Good, sir. I'm doing okay. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. I am looking forward to having this discussion because when somebody comes up to me and says, I love Star Trek and I'd like to get into the books, but I just don't know if it's going to be my thing. Your name is like on the short list of people I would recommend to test the waters. Glad to hear it. You've written a lot of my favorite books on that and a lot of other theories. And I'd love to talk about that. Okay. But what what I've also like to talk about is that you have a presence on the fan, the convention circuit that a lot of people <laughs> back when there was a convention circuit. Right. And, and people don't get to see that. And that's a tragedy because I'll, I'll tell you at Dragon Con, one of my favorite memories was just sitting down at one of your parties and hearing you tell stories to fight everything else that went on. That was just one of my favorite memories. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. What was it? A rib night party? He was Dragon actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rib Night is a tradition at Dragon Con in which we invite our friends um, and guests of the convention to come up to our suite and we chow down on uh, Fat Matt's ribs from Fat Matt's Rib Shack and uh, fried chicken that we get from a restaurant called The Colonnade. Uh, Fat Matt's Rib Shack was actually mentioned in the film Up in the Air. My wife was sitting there watching it, and George Clooney mentioned it as a good place for ribs, and we kind of went, God damn it. Uh, once, actually, we were driving over to Fat Matt's with uh, Harlan Ellison and his wife, Susan. And Harlan kept saying, yeah, okay, we're going to go out for ribs, but the best ribs I ever had was just at a hole-in-the-wall place. I can't remember the name of it. And he kept talking about the hole in the wall place. And when we pulled into Fat Matt's, Harlan was going, oh, my God, this is it. <laughs> he was so thrilled we had brought into Fat Matt's. And that's it's, it's amazing because we talk about all the big things that you see, like the the, the panels and the, the cosplay conventions. But it's just the fans getting together that really makes it special. It, it's not it's not it's not just fans i mean i have a lot of very pleasant memories from from uh our rib night parties i mean joel hodgson walking up to me and asking me if i could introduce him to walter koenig um uh maurice lamarge sitting across the table from wendy peeney and i said i don't know if you guys know each other maurice lamarge this is wendy peeney and they both fan geeked out on each other it was hilarious. Both of them said, I love your work. It was just, you know, hysterical. I could see that happening with voice actors when you don't necessarily have a face to go with the work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you've had so many cases where you were hosting panels or hosting events, and yes. you are a master of an MC. I'll be honest with you. There's some of the, what you've put into that I've tried to put into this show here. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. Uh, but, but to get back to the books for a minute, like... Okay. I find it interesting that I love first is Q squared is it's like my Q, my favorite, favorite book. Oh God, what a pain in the neck that book was to write. I mean, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm writing it. And then I get to the point where I'm jamming all the different universes together. And I suddenly realize that what I forgot to do in the course of the book was come up with clear descriptors designating the different characters in the different universes. So when I'm slamming them all together, how the hell are we supposed to distinguish which Picard and which Riker we're engaged with? So that, you know, it was three quarters of the way into the book and it was too late for me to rewrite it. So I had to come up with ways to make it very clear who was who. In the, in the finale of that book. It was very tricky. I could definitely see that. And there were times when the confusion w added to the flavor of the story. It was yeah. like one of those better next generation episodes where you're just along for the ride and, and you no, don't know what happens till the end. Exactly. But it, back then, like that was 91, which is a whole different era of Trek. And there was this idea that Next Gen was Next Gen and original series was original series and there was a firm wall between it. And, and that's so foreign now when Trek is just this giant mass set of stories being told. Right. And I just think that that book was so forward thinking in that regard. 
Well, there is a there is a massive difference between original Trek and next gen. And that massive difference is the Vietnam War. Um, before we went into Vietnam, we always knew what to do. We always knew that we were right. America was a superpower. We won everything. And original Trek reflects that American thinking. Kirk always knows what to do. You know, they have this prime directive, and the prime directive is this thing that he always quotes right before he ignores it. And at the end of the episode, Starfleet always says, yeah, okay, whatever you want to do is fine with us. I mean, there were, there were whole episodes that would not have happened if Kirk had played the slightest bit of attention to the prime directive. Next Generation is a post-Vietnam where America is no longer as confident in itself as it used to be. Everything is more tentative. Everything has to be discussed oftentimes into the ground. Um, when, if you compare sequences in the briefing room, original Trek, you'd have McCoy would present the emotional side of it. Spock would present the logical side of it. And Kirk, the everyman, would be in the middle weighing what to do and then say, okay, this is the decision we're going to make. It was very, very straightforward. In Next Generation, they'd all sit around the conference room and Picard would say to each person, okay, what do you think? And each person would say what they thought. And Picard would inevitably go with whatever the last suggestion was and that's it and it was just and and picard was absolutely faithful to the prime directive he ne he never even thought about interfering i mean he was willing to let entire planets die rather than interfere with the prime directive so you know that really comes from the revised American mindset that's post-Vietnam. The concept that we don't know everything and that we really shouldn't get involved in things that we're not really clear on. That's, a, I've not thought about that that way and I definitely wanna put some thought into that for sure. And you, there's definitely a refinement. We, we, from the, from the in-universe angle, we think of it as, well, it's, it's almost 100 years later. The Federation is bigger and more sophisticated. There's more bureaucracy. But, yeah, you got to have to acknowledge that there's a, a behind-the-scenes relevance, too. Right, exactly. I mean, Star Trek Next Generation really staked itself out in its very first episode. I mean, contrast... Wrath of Khan with Next Generation. In Wrath of Khan, Uhura, you know, when, when the ship is under fire and they're hanging there helpless in space, Uhura turns and says, they're, you know, they're sending us terms for surrender and the entire Earth and the entire Enterprise falls deathly silent because she said the S word, mm -hmm. you know, surrender. I mean, when, when in Galaxy Quest, he says, never give up, never surrender, that's Kirk. Mm -hmm. The concept of surrendering is absolutely out of the question. And indeed, when Kirk says, put them on, Uhura sounds shocked. It's like, why are we even talking to them? We don't surrender. You're freaking Captain Kirk. As opposed to Next Generation, where they are confronted with a menace. And they say, quickly, we must go to the battle bridge, separate the saucer section. And we spend 10 minutes of them running to the battle bridge while the ship separates into the saucer section and the main hull. And then they get to the saucer section and, and, and they get to the battle bridge and you're expecting, you know, a battle. And what does Picard do? He surrenders in his first episode confronted with a menace he freaking surrenders after spending 10 minutes to get to the battle bridge if it had been called the surrender bridge <laughs> i'd be okay with it <laughs> quickly to the surrender bridge well i wonder what's going to happen there well obviously they're going to surrender if he's going to surrender why in god's name did he separate the ship 
you know, so they could do the special effect. Yeah. Wow. Terrific. But, uh, you know, Picard surrendered in the very first episode, which kind of played to the fr- to the cliche of, well, of course he surrendered. He's French. Um, so naturally. But, uh, you know, Next Generation was very much its own beast and really took a while to, to find its footing, I think. And it, it wasn't until DS9 when there was an effort made to kind of stitch those two beasts back together and show how they related to each other. And I mean, it, there's still places where you're like, well, it, it's just hard to imagine that this took place in the same world, but it's fun to think of that too. Oh, yeah. I, I was never sure what to make of DS9. I mean, aside from the fact that it turned out that it was ripped off from Babylon 5, um, it was going to start Avery Brooks, who made his name playing Hawk in the Spencer TV series. And I thought that he was going to be Hawk. I thought he was going to be the most badass guy who's ever been a commander of a uh, space station. And he turned out to be kind of a reasonable guy, which I was you know, somewhat disappointed with. But I suppose it makes sense. There's no reason that he has to be a badass just because that's what he played on on uh, Spencer. But um, yeah, there, there, there was a lot there was a lot positive in DS9. Definitely thought that uh, <clears throat> I, I personally I, I found a lot to connect with there. I found uh, the idea of not having the Federation's resources to draw on every time made for really interesting storytelling ideas. Not to mention that they were stationary. Mm-hmm. I mean, they wound up introducing a ship so they could have space adventures in later seasons. But for the first several seasons, everything took place on DS9. There was no exploration. There was no searching for new lives and new civilization. I mean, it was basically Casablanca in space. Which is what I liked about it personally. Oh, yeah. Um, but so we talked about Q squared for a minute. I got to ask while I have you here okay. the scene where Riker is in prison and a strange, starving Bajoran woman is thrown at her, and her name is K A R A Kara. Was that meant to be Kira Narice? Um, I honestly don't recall. Fair I mean, enough. I wrote it. I wrote it back in 1991. You know, that's how many years is that? Thirty years ago. Sure. I mean, I don't remember then, stuff I wrote three years ago, much less 30. Sure. So I have about no it. recollection that he was actually in uh, in a prison. I mean, my feeling is if she was supposed to be Kira, I would have called her Kira. Um, you say her name is K-A-R-A, I think of Supergirl. Sure. So I honestly don't know why I called her Kara. Well, I, it, it was that the phrase was, it was Kara or something. So I thought maybe somebody was mispronouncing oh, then it. it was, if that was the phrase, then yeah, it was Kira. Okay, fair enough. Um, but like you, you were talking about the, the separation of the, the saucer from the, the, the battle bridge. And, you know, I always thought that was one of those things that was just so weird. It was such a weird concept because there were so many times that they went through the the special effects of showing the ship separating and then there were times that they would be going into the most dangerous situations possible and they wouldn't make any effort to separate the ship oh yeah and it's like but you would think that if you could get the civilians out of the way you'd try to do that yeah i mean i just i still don't understand why they separated if they're going to surrender i mean where is the sense in that i mean do they think that we're going to surrender, but we'll send the other ship away so you can't find them? Well, they probably could find them, but it's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It, it, the saucer section didn't have its own warp drive, so it would just put her around, and yeah. it, it would be a sitting duck if the, the surrender didn't go well. Right. Glad somebody else agrees with me on that. I mean, it's a great idea and concept, but it just never seemed to work out in a military sense. They came up with the idea. They said, let's show it in the pilot, even though it's going to make absolutely no story sense. Yeah. So when you're talking about, you know, if we could ever get back to conventions and if we could ever 
uh, get to the point where we have this, this camaraderie that we're looking for? Is there something you're really looking forward to? Well, yeah. Go, I mean, my job is a very lonely one. I mean, I have no co-workers here. I mean, my wife is here, but I have no co-workers. I sit down in front of my computer and I write about these worlds that exist inside of my head. It's a very lonely profession. Going out and speaking to fans helps give validity to what I do. Finding out how my work impacts on people, finding out what they like and didn't like. This is all very useful information. Not to mention the fact that I took a huge financial hit for the loss of conventions. You know, I can't sell books. I can't, you know, I can't get appearance fees. There's no conventions to go to. So that's you know, been something of a hardship. Well, sure. And that's something that you remember a time when these conventions weren't on every street corner and you didn't have 10 a year you could go to. That's, that's something that today's fans might have a hard time wrapping their head around. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I was a teenager, there was the World Con. There was a New York Star Trek convention. And there was one, and there was the New York Comic Con. And that was pretty much it. Now there's conventions all over the damn place. Not a weekend passes where there's not a convention. At least that's the way it was before COVID. I mean, I think we're going to come slowly crawling back now, now that uh, we've got the vaccinations. I mean, I'm vaccinated fully. I've gotten both shots. My wife has gotten the first shot, as has my 18-year-old daughter. So we're going to be safe to go places, you know, very soon. We're going to a convention in the third week of May in Pensacola, Florida which is famous for having been destroyed at the beginning of Godzilla versus Kong. Mm -hmm. um, although who knows? I mean, if the convention goes forward, then we'll be there. But nowadays it's really hard to tell. Although since it's Florida where they're pretty much largely insane, it will probably <laughs> go forward. I mean, the only other state where it's likely they would have a convention scheduled is Texas. Um, where, where Texas is saying that they can have 100% um, attendance at Rangers games. You know, come you know, come to a Rangers game, come for the popcorn, stay for the virus. I mean, it's, it's going to be absolutely, every Rangers game is going to be a super spreader event. But that's what happens when you take a virus and politicize it. And I'm sh I'd, I'd anticipate a lot of good episodes being written about this down the road for sure. Good episodes of what? <laughs> uh, possibly Star Trek, but really any sci-fi show that tends to put a spin on current events. Oh yeah, that that's that's certainly true enough. So I mean, if I look at the most of your books, and I, I look at the about the author page, they almost always mention that you met your wife at a Star Trek convention. Yes. And I love that because that's another one of those things that like today's fans would say, well, sure, we, we, of course we, we got together there. But back then it was such a weird thing that you actually made friends at these weird events that the rest of the public didn't know about. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't know about them at first either. I mean, I found out about the first Star Trek convention because it got covered in an article in TV Guide. You know, I was I was living down in where that was like Pennsylvania. And I, you know, this was before computers and this is before the internet. I was unaware of the existence of the Star Trek convention until I read about it in TV Guide. And then I said, oh my God, I've got to go to that. And from then on, I, I you know, I, I wasn't there for the first one, but I was there for the second. And actually my father arranged it so that I could cover it for the, uh, for the Philadelphia Bulletin, the newspaper that he was working for. So I went up there with the press pass and it was great. Press pass gets you into the press room, mm -hmm. gets you into, you know, all the press meetings. I mean, that was, that was really terrific. Yeah. That's definitely the, the way to travel if you can. Yeah. And, and like I said, I will tell people that 
when I go to a convention, I often eat dinner with people that I didn't know at lunchtime. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very typical. I mean, um, it's a great place to make friends, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, you know, and uh, although uh, to be technical, I did not meet, well, actually I met my first wife at a Star Trek convention. I met my second wife at a science fiction convention. Oh, okay. So uh, I just, I just wanted to make that clear. That, that's, that's a fair point to make. And I, that's okay. uh, I tend to lump them all together because, you know, it's been a while since there were a lot of Star Trek specific conventions. There's a lot of fandoms come along for the ride yeah. too. That's certainly true. And I think that's a great thing because to get down that, that mentality that, or I'd almost call it a stereotype that Star Wars fans don't like Star Trek fans and Marvel fans don't like DC fans and, Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, that's nothing new. When Star Trek fans first started showing up at the Worldcon, science fiction fans were furious because what were these Star Trek fans doing at their convention? And they actually had a meeting in which they tried to in which they tried to discuss what the hell should they should do about all these Star Trek fans showing up. And one woman stood up and said, you know, you guys have been wondering how in the world to get females to come to these conventions for years. Have you not noticed that 50% of the Star Trek fans are female? Women are here and you're complaining about it. And all the guys kind of stared at each other and that was the end of the meeting. All right. <laughs> So this concept of enmity between fandoms is absolutely nothing new. I, I even wrote a short story that satirized Star Trek versus Star Wars fandom in an anthology that just came out called Space 1975. I remember hearing about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got a short story in it which an entire planet gets destroyed because of rivalry between um, Star Trek and Star Wars fans. And I very seldom meet somebody who doesn't like both and admit it freely. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not like Mets and Yankees. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, somebody, somebody I remember once called into a sports radio show and sport and the announcer, you know, the announcer said, you know, well, which team do you like, the Mets or the Yankees? And the guy said, I like both. And the announcer said, you can't. <laughs> It's not allowed. You have to like one and hate the other. I mean, I was once at a Mets game and they were playing the Boston Red Sox. So there were a ton of Boston Red Sox fans in the audience. And what slowly evolved over time was that the Mets fans would shout, Let's go Mets! And the Red Sox fans would shout, let's go Red Sox! And then everyone would shout in unison, Yankees suck! <laughs> I mean, I just have no idea how it evolved. You know, people, people, it's just like people going back and forth, back and forth, and somebody started shouting, Yankees suck, Yankee, and it just got incorporated. And the Mets and the Yankees, and the Mets and the Red Sox fans kind of said like, yeah, we love our teams, but the Yankees suck. So, you know, we actually managed to find common cause. Um, and I really wish that Star Wars and Star Trek fans would find that that common cause. I they, mean, you know. They almost did. And I hate to rag on any fandom because, like, I'm really a live and let live kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But there was a minute where everybody just kind of said, okay, you can be a Star Trek fan and you can be a Star Wars fan. But can we both agree that Twilight sucks? <laughs> God, Twilight. I mean, there was a time where I drove my daughter, my daughter Ariel, who was about 13 or 14 at the time, to a, uh, to a Barnes & Noble where they were doing a release party for the new Twilight book. And there were all these teenage girls lined up outside. And I said, I wonder what I could write that could get teenage girls lining up. Not that I was interested in teenage girls, I just want their money. And Ariel says to me, well, read Twilight. You know, just read read the first book. 
And I said, okay. And I read the first book and I came back to Ario and I said, okay, here's the problem. I can't write this badly. <laughs> and she did not talk to me for a week. She was so pissed off that I had dismissed her beloved Twilight book. But yeah, Twilight was really very, very badly written. Um, oh, God, I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, right. In uh, my book, Pulling Up Stakes, I actually had one of the vampire characters comment that Twilight was referred to by vampires as a vampireia because it was so full of shit. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And again, I, I don't want to brag on what anything anybody likes, but it did. And the, the, it's kind of gone away. So it doesn't really matter as much anymore. But there was a minute where it was trying to be this, uh, as big of a fandom as all the others were familiar with. And the world just said, not having it. Yeah. Yeah. Tr I mean, but that came down to quality. I mean, there's so much Star Trek and there's so much Star Wars that there's going to be quality out there. I mean, for every person who doesn't like the rise of Skywalker, there's people who absolutely adore the Mandalorian, mm -hmm. you know, for every person who doesn't like next gen, there are people who still like original track. Um, Twilight, the source material is just so bad. It, it's the characters are so poorly thought out. The plot makes absolutely no sense. And the books are so terribly written that you come to the realization that the only people who could really like it are young girls whose taste buds have not really come together in their brains. You know, they don't really understand when something is badly written. They don't have the, uh, the ability to discern crap. And especially with a, something like a Star Wars or a Star Trek, where your setting is literally the universe, literally the galaxy. Yes. And you can make all sorts of stories. I really, if somebody says, I don't like this particular Star Trek, name one, I don't care. And they say, I don't, that's not my thing. Okay, that's, that's great. Because we have a whole other galaxy of stories we can tell. If that's not the one you want to dig, right? that's, that's fair. And I, I think we need to remember that is that that we're exploring strange new worlds. You might not like all of them. That's, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So Peter, I know that you've got something that you're coming up against and I want to respect your time crunch, but um, do you don't worry about it. I have to get my daughter, but I don't have to leave till one o'clock. So I'm okay. 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 Well, that's fair enough. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, I, I didn't put you in a bind. No, uh, but you've also explored, we talked about Marvel and DC, and you've been a big name in those as well. Um, you've written quite a few of my favorite issues of Action Comics now that we're at it. Really? I know that was okay. a while ago, but um, I did like that run. Okay. Uh, how did you, how do you feel writing for comics differs from the, the novels where you can get, you know, five, 600 pages if you want it? A novel is the purest form of storytelling. There's me and there's the words and there's the reader. You know, nothing interferes aside from the typesetter. In comic books, you are entirely dependent on the artist. If the story is great, if, I'm sorry, if the artist is great, people will love the story. If the art is bad, people will blame the writer. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had people say, you know, wow, Peter David really apparently forgot how to write when this <laughs> issue came out. The artwork was terrible, but it didn't dawn on them that that's what the problem was. You know, I'm the same writer. I'm the same guy putting down words. And if there's a difference in the artist, maybe the concept that the artist could not tell the story is what impacted your ability to enjoy it. That's one of the reasons that when it comes to scripting comic books, I now write full script. I used to write in what was called Marvel style, in which you describe the plot, you toss in some dialogue, 
and you let the artist tell the story. And what happened, I mean, and which was fine when you were working with the older generation of artists who knew what they were doing. The new generation of artists apparently did not know how to tell stories. So I started writing them full script, which means that I write down every panel and I put in all the dialogue that's going to go into the panel. I tell the story on a panel by panel basis and I eliminate the artist having to make the storytelling decisions. That gives me the most control over the stories. It's certainly the simplest way to go about it. I mean, I mean, I still remember many years ago, I was going to be having Iron Man guest star in an issue of the Hulk. And I wanted to read the script for the issue of the Iron Man that was going to be coming out right before my issue of the Hulk so I could get current. And they sent me the script. And the script was two pages long. The first page summarized, you know, summarized what happened in the previous issue. And the next thing said, pages three to 22, big fight, go nuts. And that was it. And I read this and I'm going, how in the hell can the writer claim that he's writing this? You know, pages three to 22, big fight, go nuts. No, the artist is doing the work. You know, that script made me start to understand the point of view of the image guys who felt that the artist was everything and the writer was nothing. When the writer isn't contributing to the script, yeah, I totally understand how you get that point of view. So I feel that as the writer, it's my responsibility to detail everything that goes onto the page. And if the artist comes up with a better way to tell the story, fine, but I want him to clear it with me first. I mean, my policy is very simple. Don't change any of my scripting without telling me, and I won't redraw any of your figures without telling you. I think that's pretty reasonable. Yeah. I, I, especially when you're talking about three to 22, 19 pages of almost anything when, hey, I'm sure that as a writer, you might be trying to foreshadow something or you might be wanting to make a reference. It's like, hey, make sure that you put in the kryptonite ring here and that you use this particular Iron Man armor because it comes in later. I mean, that. well, that was one of the reasons that I started doing full script because when I would put things into, into the Marvel style of writing, I would lay seeds for story elements that were going to be paid off in later issues. And since the artist didn't see why they were there, on occasion, the artist would just drop it from the story. And I'd be going, wait a minute, where's the whatever it was? And it's like, well, I didn't have room to put that in. Well, now I'm screwed because I had set that up for a story element to be paid off on in the next issue. So when you're doing it full script, you can guarantee that everything that you want is going to wind up being on the page. Does doing it full script sometimes get down to an almost uh, composition aspect where you can say you'd want this character on this side of the panel and this one on the other, or is that still something the artist has some domain over? Oh, the artist has domain over that. If I'm looking for a very specific effect, then I will say, okay, uh, we want this person over here. We want this person over here. Or I might call for a specific art technique. I'll say, okay, we're going to be doing a triptych here. And this is going to be what's in the three panels of the triptych. But generally speaking, my directions will simply say angle on this, angle on that. This is what's in the panel. I generally, you know, or close up, something like that. Um, I will give general camera directions, but the actual layout, I mean, there are some writers who actually will design page layouts and include the page layouts in the script. My attitude is if the artist can't come up with a better page layout than I can come up with, then he really needs to be doing a different job. Fair enough. So you're, you're definitely seeing that that's a limitation on what you feel comfortable yes. doing. Mm -hmm. And that, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, so it's like you're, you're talking about writing the script almost like it is an actual screen script. 
And I've always wondered why we didn't get more of your work on the actual screen. Is that a personal preference of yours? Oh, no. I problem is I live in New York, not L.A. I don't have an L.A. Um, agent. Um, so I'm limited in what I can do. I have like half a dozen screenplays that have gone absolutely nowhere. But, um, I mean, I have been on the screen. I've been on television. I co-created a TV series that ran for two seasons on Nickelodeon. I've written for Babylon 5. I've written for Young Justice. So I have I have gotten out there. Yeah, I, I know you're not, it's not never happened, but it just, right. I'm sorry, I just love your work so much. So I'm oh, just like, you. why didn't we see more of it? That It's the greedy part of me. I understand that. And it's it's a matter of getting my screenplays out to people who are actually in a position to make them. And that's not an easy job and it's no. not gotten any easier as time has gone on. No, it is not. <laughs> so with the way the industry is now with everything moving to digital comics and with the uh, eBooks being just as big of a thing as uh, traditional paper books, has that affected your marketing any? Um, well, not really. I mean, the rise of eBooks has certainly aided the rise of Crazy 8, the publishing concern of which I am one of the members, in which we put out our own books. We bypass the concept of publishers and bookstores and sell directly to the fans. That would not have been possible 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But now it's so much easier to get your material out to people at least people who are willing to pay for it. I mean, there are still people who are going, oh, you're, 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 an, you're an author. That's terrific. Where can I get your stuff for free? That's a oh, weird yeah. thing to ask. Uh, not really. There's a ton of pirate sites out there that have my Star Trek books on them, yeah. uh, my science fiction books. I mean, I generally alert the publishers whenever I find out about them. Um, I just alerted Marvel to a website that had uh, my, X -Men, my X Men novel put up on, on the pirated version. I mean, we live, in a, we live in an era where people believe that everything should be free. They should be able to get music for free. They should be able to read books for free. The concept that we earn our livings with this stuff doesn't register on them or doesn't really seem to matter. And that's, that troubles me quite a bit because I, we have the tools now to make things extremely inexpensive to the point where it's by every meaningful stretch. If you want a Peter David book, you can probably get it for a price that will not put any strain on your lifestyle. A couple of bucks. Yeah. And, and that's really probably the same couple of bucks you would have gotten if that person had paid for a $20 for a paper copy that was, you know, could kill a small cat. I mean, right. it's, the, the, the difference to you, the author, the person that made it is almost minimal. Oh, yeah. I mean, I and wrote a book called I just called think Artful. that, you know, with the tools we have, what? I wrote a book called Artful. It was published by Amazon. They've been they've offered mm -hmm. it for like $1.99. If you can't cough up two bucks for one of my books, what the hell is wrong with you? I would agree. And it's like I said, nobody would expect anybody else to work for free, whether, you know, whether you're a banker, whether you fix cars, whether you clean the street, nobody expects you to work for free. An artist shouldn't do that either. Oh, it's, it's always expected of artists. People will solicit writers and will solicit artists and they'll say, you know, come work for us. We can't pay you, but it's good exposure. You know, that, that's the thing, you know, you'll get your name out there. You'll get your, you'll get your work out there. Screw you. Pay the writer. That's something that Harlan Ellison always said. My wife talks about it getting that tattooed on her arm. Um, you know, you know, with the typeface of a typewriter. Just, you know, pay the damn writer. It, you'll, you'll get your name out there. Yeah, you're going to get your name out there to other people who also don't want to pay you. That doesn't exactly. really help you at all. Exactly right. And I, I just don't get that. It's like the day you're willing to work for me for free, I might work for you for free. <laughs> so yeah i'm sorry you have to go up against that it, but it's something that i've championed a lot on here is the fact that we have so many tools that have been invented fairly recently that we can do things so much more smartly stop trying to be a freeloader and and larger companies have to stop taking advantage of talent because yeah. the room for that is shrinking rapidly very much so um so um you're, you're part of a, an organization you said that 
works on this? Oh no, a crazy eight press. Crazy, okay. Crazy um, press. It's it's myself and a group of other writers who publish our own works. I mean, nowadays it's getting harder and harder to find publishers to put out your works. Um, and the work gets rejected for the dumbest of reasons. I mean, I mentioned a book called Pulling Up Stakes, a vampire novel. Half the editors rejected it saying it was too funny. Half them rejected it saying it wasn't funny enough. Um, one person said that they couldn't publish it because it's a vampire novel and vampire novels have to be written by women which I'm sure would come as news to everyone from Joss Whedon to Bram Stoker. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just the reasons they come up with are just idiotic or vague. And what it really comes down to is unless you are a big name author who will always sell a New York Times best selling levels or are a complete newcomer who they can seriously promote, they're not interested in you. You know, if, if you're a mid-list author, they don't want to bother with you. And that can be very, very frustrating. So a group of us mid-list authors uh, have cr uh, created Crazy Eight. It was uh, the idea of one of my friends, Mike, Michael Jan Friedman. And uh, we, we put out these collective books. Awesome. Well, I'm going to make sure that gets put in the show notes too, just in case somebody wants to check it out. Good. And I'm going to list uh, prop as Cra many of crazy your press .com. They can crazy crazy press .com. And where can people follow your stuff, your social media and whatnot? I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I have a website, peterdavid.com. I'm actually, or peterdavid.net. We have both. I mean, we did peterdavid.net because peterdavid.com was a cloisonne pin manufacturer. Uh, who apparently went out of business. So we were able to get .com as well. So, yay. <laughs> um, it was a shame though. They made good product. But uh, th those are the places where I'm pretty easy to find. Well, I, I'm going to make sure all that goes in there. Is there anything else you want to get into while I still oh, have you on the yeah, line? Oh, yeah, I have a Patreon account also. Okay. So you, you can follow me on my Patreon account. What's a neat little perk that somebody can get on there? Oh, you know, I, I, I put reviews, I, I, I put up uh, uh, original material, that kind of thing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Peter, thank you so much for doing this. And I would really love to talk to you about all sorts of stuff. And if I could have you back sometime in the future, I'd love to do that. Sure. Not a problem. Okay. Thanks so much and have yourself a good day. Thanks. You too.